And God bless you. Good morning. And uh, what a joy and privilege it is for me to share the word with us. Let's go to God in prayer and uh, commit this time as we hear the word to Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this privilege of gathering together as a congregation, as an assembly, a faith assembly, Lord, that has been planted here, Lord, as a special part of your body. We praise you, Lord, for your holy presence. We sense that holy presence. It's palpable, Lord, even right through worship. The moment we stepped in, we want to honor that presence. We want to give you the rightful place as the Holy One of Israel, as the God who is holy and who even pronounces holiness, Lord, in every aspect of our lives. Hide your servant behind the cross and may your name be lifted up and exalted this morning as you put in us, Lord, your heart, your heart to fear you, your heart to love you. We praise you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's my joy and privilege to share on holy justice this morning, uh, recognizing that you are at the closing message of the We Are a Holy People series. And we are at technically the last day of the midpoint of the year. And uh, we live at a time, and I say this by way of introduction, we, we live at a time when justice and fairness means different things to different people. There is a greater moral relativism in our modern society compared to even half a century ago. There are diverse ideas of marriage, of family, which are creeping all over the world and which at its core are driven by different conceptions of what is just and fair, depending on who has that opinion. For youths globally, at the Davos World Economic Forum last year, the majority of the five calls of action by youths and young people who gathered together with the world leaders, but they had their own forum, the majority of the five calls to action had justice themes, AI and inclusion, climate justice, and civic empowerment. But closer to home, or perhaps closer to our phone, we who are part of the cyber community as well, who live in the virtual places as well as in the actual places, we know that our smartphone, this handheld computer, gives each of us, in a sense, that opportunity and we've seen the best of it, we've seen the worst of it, but we become the judge, the jury, and the executioner on various items and agendas and problems in news reports that we read here, including on court cases that have not been heard. And this is called conviction by the court of public opinion. We are all, and I think if we're honest enough, we can admit it, you know, each of us in our own way, irrespective of how much time we spend, we are cyber-watching armchair judges and juries who can offer an opinion on anything and everything. But the question that I begin with really for all of us is, by whose definition and by what standard is justice defined? Let's look at some definitions that give us more clues. And so here is the first slide. We look at dictionary definitions. Justice is the maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishments. It's the quality of being just, impartial or fair, or the principle or ideal of just dealing or right action. It's, to put it simpler, fairness in the way people are treated. And then we see another definition that comes from a legal information institute that recognizes the ethical and philosophical idea. Let's look at the next slide. Moving beyond dictionary meanings, from an ethical perspective, it means giving each person his or her due. And then when we look at it from a word etymological perspective, trying to look at the origin of the word justice, it is derived 
from the Latin word jus, which means righteousness and the rule of law. It's actually sort of indirect because the English word comes from an old French word for justice that means uprightness, equity, vindication of right, administration of law. And then justitia which leads you to jus or just. And there you have one of the earliest philosophers in history, Aristotle, sharing this idea of justice consisting of righteousness or complete virtue in relation to one's neighbour. Uh, bear in mind these two thoughts about the links with righteousness. I will come back to that later on in this message. Now, when we talk about justice though, beyond dictionary meanings, beyond the ethicist's perspective, beyond philosophical understandings and other layers and uh, disciplines, for us as believers, justice must be grounded in God and in His revealed Word. And hence, this particular segment comes very nicely and neatly in the Holiness series. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 28 verse 5 that evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. So let me begin with my first main point that I want you to take note of, and that is life may be unfair, but God is just. What does unfairness look like to each of us? And we've all been through a fair bit of life, even for some of the younger ones that may be graduating, and even for some younger than that. But here, here is a list, it's not a complete list, Termination from em employment, unemployment, being bypassed for promotion. What if we don't have a life partner? What if we're divorced? No children, we've gone through a miscarriage, we've seen the passing on of loved ones, we're estranged from a family member, or perhaps we might have disproportionate care caregiving responsibilities, which have all taken a toll and makes us feel that life is unfair. And indeed, life may be unfair, but that's not an evaluation of who God is. God is just. God is just. And let me now share with us a story that illustrates this point. And it's an inspiring true story of a lady called Bethany Hamilton, an American professional surfer and writer. At 13 years of age in 2003, while she was out at sea from Hawaii, her left arm was bitten off in a shark attack. She lost 60% of her blood in the aftermath, was in hypolemic shock, and she went into, as you would imagine, tremendous shock and trauma. And that's how she looks like without that left arm. And from her perspective at that point in time, life would have been very unfair. She had potential as a competitive surfer, identified as one of the most talented children, but she's lost her arm. Well, less than a month after that shark attack, she returned to surfing. She participated in major competition after major competition after major competition, winning multiple national and global surfing accolades and achievements including the U.S. National Scholastic Surfing Association first prize, and in the World Junior Championship in 2009, a second place, defeating able-bodied surfers in the process. There are two excellent family-friendly films about her life, which are also Christian-based. One is called Soul Surfer, which I've shared with friends who've seen it with me. It's very inspiring. And another more recent one called Unstoppable, and if you have the opportunity to go and view that. Hamilton, Bethany Hamilton, attributes her strength to her Christian faith. She married a youth minister. Today, she's a mother of four children at 34 years of age and is an inspirational writer and a motivational speaker and lives out the fact that life may be unfair, but God is just. God has given us such a great platform that she never would have had. Otherwise, here are three verses that describe 
God's relationship with justice. And they are found, all three of them in Isaiah. This is the ESV version. God is a God of justice. God loves justice. And God is exalted in justice. Now, some of us, and we look at the next slide, some of us, older Christians, have read this story about Moses in Meribah, the incident in Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 to 13, which cost Moses his entry into the promised land. We probably heard some thoughts about that from sermons. Some of us who have been walking longer with the Lord in terms of our faith maybe have tried to process that. And it is perplexing, I won't deny that, uh, was it because of presumptuousness? Was it because of not honouring the holiness of God that he struck the rock instead of speaking to it? I'm not going to unpack those reasons for us. But I'm asking us, for the purposes of the point I am making, to put ourselves at a human and psychological level in Moses' shoes. Here was Moses, the most spiritual man of his generation, described as the meekest man on earth in Numbers 12, verse 3, who was described in strict Scripture as the man that God knew face to face, Deuteronomy 34, verse 10, and who after the golden calf incident, God said, let me wipe them out and I will build an entire generation from your seed. And he implored God not to do so in the Exodus 32 account. Frankly, based on his spirituality, the Israelites, if it was just on his spirituality, would have been inside the promised land in a fortnight. But eventually, as we know, they went round and round in the wilderness because they didn't choose to believe the minority report, they chose to believe the majority report. And yet, here's Moses, that for one sin, one sin, it cost him his place in the promised land. Personally, I don't think he fully understood the why about that denial and maybe even the proportionality of the punishment. But we can see, and we're still in the, next, in the earlier slide actually, but we can see his godly outlook and perspective in his closing speech to the Israelites. And that is the key verse that I picked out where he describes God as a God of faithfulness and without injustice. May we have that posture too, even when we do not understand the ways of God in our own lives, whether fully or in part. And now we'll have the next slide. I want to be honest with us that there are mysteries about God's justice facets of God's justice. For example, when would it be meted out? How would it be meted out? And we have examples in Scripture. Job, for example, when he went through that horrific series of trials where he lost his possessions, he lost his children, he lost his health, he lost the company of his wife in a series of back-to-back -back blows or near simultaneous setbacks. But the interesting thing is, at the end of that trial, when God restored everything back and more, God never explained to him why he experienced the trials that he did. I believe Job, of course, would understand that once he gets to heaven, when we will know fully, even as also we are known. But he didn't get the answer in this life, at least not based on recorded scripture. Habakkuk, Pastor Andy Davis from America, describes the whole message of Habakkuk succinctly why does a just God tolerate injustice? That's really the question, the key question. And in Habakkuk 1 verses 2 to 4, we see Habakkuk complain about this. Why are you tolerating injustice? But I want to say to us, and you know, it's a point more for reflection for each of us, silence is not a stop, delay is not denial. God as the scriptures tell us in two truths, will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And I pause there to say that that man is Jesus Christ. I gave you the example of Job, Jesus on the cross, also at one point, as recorded, 
did not have the mental comprehension of why he was experiencing what he did. Because he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so he understands what it is like not to get the answers to life's unfairness. And we also know there's a character about God's judgment which is superior from any judge, any justice who sits in our supreme courts. And that is that God judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. Now, there is an important quality about justice that is linked to the series that you're on. And I think you can guess it. And we have the next slide now. God's justice is holy. It is a holy justice. We know about Sodom and Gomorrah, but I'm not going to use that example. But let me begin with, on this second point of the holiness of God's justice, with a reference to Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, who offered a strange fire to God, and then the fire of God came from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And that's a caution for us. It's a caution especially also for worship leaders not to offer strange fire. Now, there was no strange fire earlier. It was a beautiful time of worship. So, but this is an interesting caution for, for us, even when we worship the Lord, to do it in the fear of Him, to do it in regard to His holiness, His way. And we know that in the aftermath of that account in Leviticus 10, Moses pronounced that what God revealed was, among those who approach me, I will be regarded as holy. And in the sight of all people, I will be honoured. And so the Bible then records that Aaron held his peace. Of course, as a father, you lose two sons like that, right? Um, but after hearing the word of the Lord, that God will be regarded as holy and honoured, he held his peace. American theologian R.C. Sproul said that this story and the story that I'm going to share next are not stories for the faint or faint of heart. So let's have the next slide now. And this is the story of Uzzah. You might be wondering who's Uzzah. You can read the account in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. His only offense, if you could even call it an offense, was trying to keep the Ark of the Covenant from falling into the mud when the oxen who were pulling the ox cart, the ark was sitting on, and you see that in the backdrop of the picture, stumbled, and he put out his hand to take hold of the ark, and he was struck dead. Now that may seem very harsh in human terms, and there are some observations that R.C. Sproul makes about this story, and you can read that at your leisure, but I want to say that, again, this illustration shows us the holiness of God. Now, these stories that I've just covered with us, Nadab and Abihu, Uzzah, just selected examples, these are not authored by, as one critic put it, ancient, primitive, pre-scientific, semi-nomadic Jewish people who interpreted the events they saw in the light of their own peculiar theology. Nor is Jesus a different deity from the explosive, hot-tempered, ill-willed deity that thundered from Sinai in the Old Testament? And so I have this next slide for us on, is it a schizophrenic God that we see between the Old Testament and the New Testament? So this is my own paraphrase of what R.C. Sproul, who's written a lot about holiness and about this aspect. In the Old Testament, we can, we can take a a sort of paradigm that man is very, very, very bad and God is very, very, very mad. And then in the New Testament, God is very, very, very glad because he is very, very, very dead. We've had Father's Day, so I'm not putting it down for one minute, but I'm just trying to make a point. And, and then we believe that we are not so very, very, very bad. Are we dealing with different deities? Is God schizophrenic? Is the Old Testament irrelevant? Or is this a false dichotomy? That God is both and. God is both and. There is both the love of God 
and the holiness of God. And it's interesting, this wasn't in my notes, but I was impressed to share this. In Psalms 2, the Messianic Psalm, there's a reference to three different relationships we have with the Lord. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice in His name with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry. It speaks about three different dimensions. The fear of the Lord, the rejoicing, and the intimacy. And yes, it is true. We begin by calling Him Abba Father. Our Father which art in heaven, as the Lord has taught us in the Lord's Prayer. And the relationship of father-child or beloved child. Each of you are beloved child of God. As many as received Him, to them gave He the right to become the sons of God, even to them who believed in His name. John 1.12. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. It will take an eternity for us to know God. But this facet that Reverend Lindsay has been preaching on is such an important facet that has often been overlooked in the modern church. And there is a holiness about the justice of God that we do not want to trifle with or take lightly. Now, some of us may still not be entirely convinced and may still think, hmm, you know, we're in New Testament. All right, let me show you New Testament evidence then. And the next story is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And guess what? The last time I checked, that story is in the New Testament. And it's in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. So guess what happens? They lie to the Holy Spirit by, clay, by basically bringing only part of the proceeds of sale of the property at the apostles' feet. Now, nothing wrong with that. They had the choice to do so, having sold their property. They could have chosen to just give a part. But it was the pretense. It was the lying by trying to give the impression to the apostles that they were bringing all the sales. And husband and wife colluded, clandestine conduct. They lied to God and there was attendant judgment. Both fell dead. That is the holiness of God. That is the holy justice of God. Now, I believe, and this is my personal conviction, that we will still see Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. It's just that they got there very fast because God had to probably protect them from further consequences of their sin. Sin is always a slippery slope. And I share a modern anecdote on this. I'm not going to mention names. It's obviously something I don't want to do. But a Christian leader whom I had known a couple of decades ago, a friend, unbeknown to his business partners, he was actually secretly cheating them by overbilling. How did I know? Because the widow revealed it to me after his passing. He sadly died from an unexpected heart attack. And I believe we'll see him in heaven too. It's just that he got there a lot faster because God sometimes does that to protect his holiness and also to protect that person from further sin. Now you may be wondering, but you know, what's wrong with that? Can I not tolerate a little bit of it? Tolerate a little bit of sin in my life? 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, the Apostle Paul says, but I discipline my body and bring it under subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. King James Version, I myself should be a castaway. What? The Apostle Paul, who has given us much of the New Testament, could become a castaway? Yes, could become a castaway. If you do not honor the holiness of God in your life, and so we don't cut corners in our honouring God's holy justice in our dealings with others. Now, to fortify the point about why our God is not suffering from a mental illness of schizophrenia, I'd show you this final slide on the second point before I move on to my third and final point. And this too is New Testament. Hebrews 12 verse 29 reveals God as a consuming fire. For our God is a consuming fire. So that's one reference to the name and the description of God. And I pray for us, I pray for each of us that we will be filled continually with a fresh fear of the Lord. And there's an advantage in that too. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as the book of Proverbs tells us. 
But may we be filled with that fear of the Lord, that the people of faith gathered here will also be a people of fear, not of terror. God did not give us a spirit of fear, understood in a negative sense, but of power and of love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7, but I'm talking about the fear of the Lord, that reverential fear, that respectful fear of the holiness of God. My third and final point has to do with another attribute of the holy justice of God, and we'll have the next slide on. Now, you remember the word etymology we saw earlier in Latin, jus, and uh, the Aristotelian philosophy? Interestingly enough, God's holy justice also involves righteousness. That is the link. And righteousness here is doing right in God's eyes. Biblically, the words for righteousness, sedaka, and justice, mishpat, are interchangeable. They describe both a person's conduct and the collective righteousness of the group. And this is the Fleming Rutledge comment on this. That the English words sound nothing like each other, justice and righteousness, but these two words, which are not semantically connected in English, are the same word group in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New. And if one looks up justice in the dictionary of the Bible, you will be referred to righteousness. So what does that mean? So we need to understand, again, some aspects of this link between righteousness and justice. Again, from the ESV, God loves righteousness and justice, and we also know righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. And so as Reverend Lindsay invited all of us to be in prayer, especially with the Love Singapore 40-day prayer and fast, and what God is impressing us to pray about, I also invite you to pray for our leaders. Pray for Prime Minister Lawrence Wong and his government that there will be righteousness and justice that will be the foundation of our government. That is a call to prayer also. Now, if we look at a key verse next, which is Micah 6, verse 8, this shows a facet of righteousness. And so you can probably discerned by now that a unique feature of God's justice is that it's not a stand alone. There is a link with righteousness. And we see in Micah 6 verse 8, I've put up three translations here, that it is accompanied with mercy. This is a key verse for many Christian lawyer societies around the globe. Uh, Micah 6 8, what we call the Micah mandate. To do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. But it's interesting, it doesn't say to love justice, it says to love mercy. Now, if we look at the next slide, um, I unpack this a little. Um, another word for mercy is loving kindness. In Hebrew, this is the hesed of God. And as I mentioned, and I reiterate, the verse did not say we love justice, but we love mercy. And this is the passionate, undeserved loyalty, which is the defining quality in God's holy character. Those who know God will act in the same way towards others. Another slide that also um, exegetes this particular text. We see that the Beatitudes includes an attitude of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God is a merciful God. He does not give us what we deserve. So, I would challenge any one of us to ask for justice. If we ask for justice, I think we will get what we deserve, but we got what we do not deserve. We love because He first loved us. We love mercy because He first loved mercy. And here is another note from another commentary. Our love for God is shown in how we treat others around us. What are practical ways in which we can do that? Here comes the next slide. And no, uh, I wasn't paid to put up this slide. <laughs> but this is a practical way to, to do it. Acts of mercy around us. You're already making an impact and inspiring. You're loving your neighbor in the neighborhood. And that's an excellent platform and an IPC that you can be involved in. 
to also show the love of God through acts of mercy, which is part and parcel of His righteous justice. So, that's a valuable, practical, in-situ opportunity for you to inspire by inspiring community, by being involved in Inspire Community Services. Now, there are many, many things I can say, but time uh, will fail me uh, to cover all the ideas about what justice looks like um, based on God's lens, but I'm just going to cover them very, you know, almost speedily. Uh, bringing justice to the fatherless, Isaiah 1.17, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another, Zechariah 7, verse 9, do justice and righteousness, Jeremiah 22, verse 3, do not deprive the righteous of justice, that is Proverbs 18, verse 5. Those are just different, different illustrations. But there is no better elucidation of God's righteous justice than the Sermon on the Mount. And here we are. Um, and the next slide, which is my last slide before the conclusion, are three examples of this. The first of this is a very interesting verse, which is found in Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24, which tells us that when you are offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, not you have something against your brother because you are supposed to be operating in forgiveness, but you remember that your brother has something against you. What does Jesus say? Leave your gift at the altar, before the altar, and go first, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I saw this in vivid terms as a junior lawyer. I was acting and covering for a lawyer colleague, and I attended in person to a client in a commercial case. And frankly, I think I got quite impatient as a junior lawyer. You know, you're still being matured by God. Not that I'm not being matured now, but I think it's a different level of maturity. So I was quite direct and uh, brusque in my manner and tone, actually probably offended the client in terms of my tone. So that was midweek. Huh? Come Sunday at my church service, I was worshipping God, and then who should I see in the pew on the other side? That same client. And then I got really convicted by the Holy Spirit. Well, how we are worshipping, you know. So when the worship was over, as convicted by the Holy Spirit, I just walked over, and then I beckoned him to go outside the church building, we went outside the church building, and, and then I asked for forgiveness for my manner, for the way I had spoken to him. And he was gracious enough to release that forgiveness. And having reconciled, we came back into the worship service. So that was a really practical illustration of what I've just illustrated to you. But it doesn't have to be that illustration only. If God is showing you that your brother, your sister, has something against you, go and make that right. This is countercultural. This is righteous justice. A second illustration, same slide, turning the other cheek. And no, that's not an application, the diagram, okay? Uh, the point is not that once you turn the cheek after that, uh, you can go and, you know, <laughs> hit, the, hit the person that did wrong to you. It's 70 times 7. But what is Jesus saying? I think Jesus is telling us that instead of a justice response, what if he's inviting us to a grace-filled response? Unless he's calling you to make a stand for righteousness in that given case, and there are clients, there are Christians who are called to actually make a stand for righteousness and truth in the given case. But there are some other cases when it involves your rights, and maybe the grace response, the righteous justice response, is to give up the right to be right. A third illustration, and I'm going to share a very personal testimony as I close with this. The third example is to love your enemies. Wow, very, very hard. Humanly, very difficult, right? How to pray for those who persecute us. How to love our enemies. Um, so I'm going to share an anecdote. Uh, I've shared this before in a lawyer's circle. This is about a client whom I acted for more than 15 years ago. And I remember while I was doing that case for that client, he egged me more than once to lodge an ethical complaint against my opponent, and I declined. That's not my ethos. I wouldn't do it. So God blessed us. We succeeded in, um, you know, by His grace uh, in a number of the, the 
mini cases leading up to the trial. And, um, and that was favor and grace by God. But at trial, midway during his cross-examination, and he was plaintiff, so he went first, he started getting cold feet. And during an appropriate adjournment, he said he wanted to settle. He instructed me he wanted to settle. So to cut a long story short, we settled. I rendered my final invoice, and I thought it would be paid, and that's the end of the matter. Neither of these things happened. He lodged an ethical complaint against me to the Law Society, and this was before I started serving in the Law Society. So sometimes God allows things because He's preparing your heart for His service, for greater service. But he made that complaint, and I, of course, had a theory about why he was doing it, because he didn't want to pay that final invoice. It was leverage to try and get me to withdraw the invoice. I didn't succumb to that tactic. And I held my ground ethically because I felt that it's important that from a defense of ethical righteousness to present what we have done in this case and let the Law Society decide. Well, suffice to say that the Law Society threw out that complaint, but he was relentless prior to that decision because he was writing letter after letter, even after the deadlines, to invite the Law Society to investigate me. Well, I forgave him, prayed for him. The Christian lawyer who introduced him to me, and I remembered, I said, let's pray for him. He was actually very astonished by my response. But, you know, God gave grace. Now, years later, last year, during a funeral, guess who I should see? I see him, the client who complained. I didn't feel a tinge of revenge or anger or angst or the need to try and go on a vendetta towards him. No. And the person who passed away was someone who he was very close to and he was definitely in grief as he was, you know, speaking to me as well and sharing that grief. And God gave me the opportunity last year to minister comfort with compassion to him over that loss during the funeral. How is that possible? It doesn't come from me. And I close with this. This righteousness, this righteous justice that I've showed us can only come from God. It is because of what Christ has done for us on the cross that we receive the righteous justice, the holy justice of God. Christ said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do as He died on the cross. And Romans 5 verse 10 tells us, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? You see, everything comes back to the cross where the greatest act of injustice in history took place when Christ was arrested, tried, judged, suffered, and crucified. Multiple sets of injustices but out of that injustice that he suffered, suffered out of love for you and I, God's justice and mercy was poured out by Jesus beyond measure to us and through us for a world that needs it. I believe God wants to touch us, but time is not on my side. Um, and as I ask us to close our eyes in prayer. I'm just going to pray for us for the holiness of God to fill our lives, a fear, a fresh reverence and awe of Him that we may have lost in our lives. And I'm going to ask that the mercy of God and the loving kindness of God flows in. And if some of us need prayer later after the service, you can approach me, you can approach the ministers. I'd love to pray for you. But I ask us to build an altar where we are between us and the Lord as we close this time in prayer and I pass the time back to Reverend Lindsay. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for who you are. You are holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There is none like you. If we ever receive justice from you, we know we'd be condemned to death. For the wages of sin is death. 
And yet, oh God, you love us so much, each of us, that you died for us. You gave your son Jesus for us. You took on the greatest injustice in history so that we can experience your justice and mercy. And Lord, I pray you take us deeper, each of us. Take us deeper, Lord, in the holy fear of you, a reverential fear of you, an awe of you, an honor of you. In whichever way that you're speaking, O oh Lord, if we've taken you for granted, if we've been complacent, if we've, Lord, taken your presence lightly in any aspect of our lives, Lord, we ask you to fill us with your fear again that holy fear. And I pray also, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here that you will even release the mercy of God. Hallelujah. You will release the holy justice of God, which is the righteous justice of God. To go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, to love the enemy, to pray for those who persecute them. Hallelujah. We cannot do it in our own strength, but we invite you. We need you. This life is lived for you and you alone. And we invite you to flow through us. Even as you're dropping names on our hearts, even as you're dropping people, even as you're dropping situations, Holy Spirit, have your work in us. Touch our hearts, we pray. Hallelujah. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pass the time back to Reverend Lindsay.